focus on what matters. Welcome to the Future of Cyber Defense, our virtual event. I'm Ina Freed, Chief Technology Correspondent at Axios, coming to you from San Francisco, California. Thanks to Google for making this conversation possible to talk about you know, who and how we're establishing new cybersecurity frameworks in order to better prevent and defend against these harmful ransomware attacks. I'd like to welcome our audiences, whether you're joining on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Axios.com. Thank you for being here. Uh, you can join in the conversation on Twitter using at Axios as well as the hashtag Axios events. Over the next half hour, I'll be joined by my colleague, Margaret Harding McGill, and we'll be discussing the strategies that governments, data-driven industries, and companies are employing to protect states, supply chains, pipelines, etc., from these increasingly sophisticated ransomware campaigns. Our first guest is the Executive Director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, known as CISA. Brandon Wales joining us from Arlington, Virginia. Thank you, Director Wales. Oh, you know, thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. You know, it seems like we're talking about ransomware at a really challenging moment for the country, for the world, where we have this situation where oftentimes an individual company that is or government agency or hospital or entity of any kind who is hit with a ransomware attack perceives it as cheaper and more secure to actually pay. And then they're paying in cryptocurrency, which is very hard to track. What is the solution for this moment that we're at? And is it as challenging as it seems? You know, ransomware has become an incredible challenge, uh, a security challenge for this country, and, and one of which uh, where we need the government uh, to do more, we need the private sector to do more, um, but there's no one silver bullet to this challenge. Um, so from the government perspective, uh, there is more that we can and should do to help arm uh, the American people, the businesses in this country with the kind of information that will allow them uh, to protect their networks from uh, this type of cyber crime. There's more that we can do to, to track and go after the money and the, and the criminals that uh, are executing these attacks. Uh, but we do need more from, uh, from the private sector. We need to see more from them, both in terms of the information that they're sharing with the government after there has been an attack that could allow us to prevent future incidents. Um, we need them to think really hard about uh, the payment of these ransoms uh, because, because it has been uh, just viewed as cheaper to pay, pay off these criminals. Uh, that has only accelerated the crisis that we're in today, where it is so significant and where these criminal enterprises are going after bigger and more critical targets, like they did with the Colonial Pipeline or, or major meat producing facilities. Um, and that cannot be allowed to continue. That does seem to have been a turning point in terms of, you know, really going after critical infrastructure seems to have been a wake up call for the industry. How do we change, though, this calculus where each individual entity that's attacked looks at it and says, I can't afford the risk of losing my data. I, you know, even if I get it back, just the recovery time alone, how can we change that? And what is the role of the government in helping to change that calculus? I, I think part of that changing that calculus is, is for the, for industry to better understand that the time to grapple with ransomware is not after you've been hit. Because after you've been hit, as you've described, you're in an incredibly difficult and challenging circumstance, and you're often going to go with whatever's going to be you think is most expeditious to get your network back up and running quickly. But the actual time to address the ransomware challenges that you may face is well ahead of time, is what can I do to make my network more secure? And what can I do to make sure that my network is more resilient so that if I do face a, an attack or disruption, I can get back up and running more quickly? And there are steps that, that the that industry can take and CISA is, is working across the government to help make sure that we can feed that information into our communities, into our government agencies, into our uh, businesses to make sure that they have that type of information so that they are prepared. But after it comes, after there has been an attack, I think it matters of how quickly you're working with the government uh, to make sure that we're tracking that and we can help prevent other victims from being uh, hit just like, just like they were. 
And then in terms of the government's role, I mean, it seems like there's a couple things that have really shown potential here. One is just the prospect, and even if the government can't do it every time, just the prospect that ransoms paid may not be gone forever, that some of that can be clawed back. Again, I'm not sure there's a way to do that every time, but just having proven that it can be done some of the time, how important is that to sort of shifting the dynamics at play? Well, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is really needs to be a, a whole of nation effort. And there's a lot that the government can and should be doing. And the law enforcement community of, of this country and, and like-minded countries around the world need to do more to follow the money and go after these, these criminal enterprises, uh, whether that means taking them taking them into justice, whether that means uh, recouping some of the funds and being able to, to um, uh, you know, get those from these actors. There's more that we can and should do. But a lot of that starts right there at the beginning. Does the private sector come to the government early on with what's happening? Are they going to pay a ransom? Where are they sending it to? Um, so that the government can begin the process of, of tracing those funds, potentially maybe being able to, to, to get them back. As you said, that's not going to happen every time, but we want to make sure that every tool in our arsenal uh, is being used to combat this scourge. And as you say, part of it is sharing information, sharing information from private companies to the government, private companies sharing information with each other, as well as some of the key technology players here, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. Um, what is CISA doing? There's this new initiative that you guys are working on. What is it focused on and how does it help the issue we're talking about? Sure. So back in August, we actually announced the stand up of, of this new joint cyber defense collaborative. Um, and it is made up of, of a number of critical private sector companies, uh, largely um, ones that have very broad visibility into the cyberspace of this country and the world, major cloud providers, major uh, internet service providers, the major cybersecurity vendors, some of the, equipment, the critical uh, equipment and, and cybersecurity uh, antivirus software manufacturers. These are the companies that have the ability to see what's happening uh, across the board, government and private sector together, both in the United States and a lot of times overseas. They have the ability to understand what's happening and take action at a scale that no company can do individually. And so we've gotten everyone together with the goal of bringing together what's best available from the United States government, whether that's from CISA or intelligence and law enforcement community partners and the private sector to say, as we're seeing things happen, what can we do to actually have an effect at scale? Ransomware, as you noted, was one of the first two priorities for this new joint cyber defense collaborative. And it really is, is em, embodies the work that we are trying to do to move from our kind of previous concept of public-private partnership to real operational collaboration, taking information and being able to take collective action quickly and at a scale that's really needed to combat the problem. Um, so it really takes our, us uh, from this information sharing to kind of information enabled operations. And that's really what we've been trying to do. Um, we think the JCDC is, is a critical linchpin in this effort. Um, again, it's only a few months old, uh, but we really think that it's, it's the future of, of collective defense in the cybersecurity sphere. And even that term, cyber defense, implies that this isn't just a law enforcement issue. It isn't just a criminal issue. It's a mix, which is really interesting and challenging, of cyber criminals as well as nation states that are doing attacks, that are coordinating attacks. Do you view this more as a criminal issue, more as a you know nation state actor issue, 50-50? Um, How do you sort of look at the universe today? And, and if, if the, both are going on, is there more concern over one over the other? You know, I think that we are, we are absolutely in an environment where uh, we are facing both a concerted effort by nation states to utilize uh, cyber-related attacks uh, to be prepared for future disruptions of our critical infrastructure, to steal our technology and our, our government secrets, um, as well as criminal organizations using uh, cyber to, to further their nefarious criminal enterprises. Um, and so we need to make sure that our, um, our solutions are designed to, to address them both. And in a lot of cases, it's going to be with the same exact partners in the private sector, the same people who have the ability to detect nation state activities at scale, um, whether in large cloud environments or, or that are happening across a large number of endpoints in hosts and computers across the country. Um, and so I wouldn't say one is more important than the other. 
we need the ability to be able to detect and address both sets of threats that are happening simultaneously to this country, because that's uh, what the American people and, and the businesses across this country expect. And as you mentioned, uh, not only are the players similar, but actually the steps you want to take to defend are similar. Um, you guys, as part of this joint cyber defense collaborative, um, there are some websites where people can go and get some information. You know, what are some of the important best practices? It sounds like probably having backups that are separated from your uh, traditional system so that you can be up and running. What else should companies be doing to prepare ahead of time? Since, as you mentioned, there's a lot more you can do before an attack than after. Sure. And so, you know, we, we've put together a lot of information, not only from CISA, but from partners across the government at StopRansomware.gov as really to be a one-stop shop uh, for information on how you can arm yourself uh, to be better protected. But in terms of your immediate question, you know, one thing that we're pushing heavily during uh, October, which is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, is the implementation of multi-factor authentication. The use of multi-factor authentication on all privileged accounts, on internet-facing accounts, um, on your personal accounts on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is probably the single most important thing uh, you can do to pr protect yourself against uh, cyber incidents. Uh, but also, if you're a company, uh, take stock of your cybersecurity. See what you're doing that may not be too cyber smart. Are you, use, you, are you using um, out-of-date software? Uh, do you have uh, accounts uh, that are internet accessible that have um, applications that are unpatched uh, software or hardware? Uh, so there's things like that that you can do today that will make a significant and measurable uh, improvement in your cybersecurity. And that's what we need. Because frankly, particularly when it comes to ransomware operators, they are looking for the weakest link. Um, they're not going to spend a lot of time trying to get into every single company. They're going to look at people who have these very commonly uh, used vulnerabilities, and they're going to exploit them. So if you're protecting yourself, if you're patching your systems, if you're not using out-of-date software, if you've got multi-factor authentication enabled, you know what? There's a pretty good chance that you're going to be safe. Thanks so much, Director Wales. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I really appreciate you taking the time. No, thank you so much, Nina. Really glad to be here and, and talk to your audience. Up next, we have a view from the top segment with my colleague, the co-founder and CEO of Axios, Jim Vandehei. Uh, thank you very much, Ina. Uh, it's now my pleasure uh, to bring you a conversation with Kent Walker, who's the Senior Vice President for Global Affairs at Google. Uh, Kent, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure, Jim. Good to see you. Uh, so one of our annual uh, views from the top to sort of get your mind on this big topic of cyber uh, security. Uh, I think it's the, the thing everyone kind of fears but doesn't fully uh, understand. Obviously, Google puts a lot of uh, mind power, a lot of money uh, into this topic. Talk about what Google as a company is doing so far, especially as it relates to the efforts that you see from the Biden administration. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I mean, security is the cornerstone of Google's product strategy. That's how we keep more people safe online than anyone else in the world. But how did we get to that point? Well, we did learn some lessons from the past. Uh, a dozen years ago, after we had nation state actors uh, attack our services, we launched a, a major initiative to fundamentally reshape security throughout Google. We realized we had built up strong perimeter defenses, but once an attacker got inside, they had access to a lot of information. Uh, at the time, we called this being crunchy on the outside, but chewy in the middle. That obviously had to change. So we spent months reshaping our whole security approach from the ground up. We developed new security techniques. We rebuilt our architecture. And we adopted a defense in depth approach to security. So what, what does defense in depth mean? Uh, one example is we take a zero trust approach. We verify anyone accessing our systems and we use techniques like multi-factor authentication because we knew that going forward, we had to expand the way we were thinking about the whole threat landscape and continually stay uh, evolving uh, to stay ahead of the attackers. So that's the approach we bring to users. And people, we, we think people shouldn't have to worry about whether they have the latest security. They should just experience it through products that have security built in by default. So we automatically turn we... on security measures. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. You know, how worried should the average person watching this be about the cybersecurity threat? Like we, I think everyone reads or see the, sees these stories about these hacks on government or hacks on companies. Uh, people feel like some of their data does get exposed. Like how big of a threat is it? How much time do you spend thinking about it? 
Yeah, it is clearly one of the, the biggest threats out there. As you've seen in the last couple of years, we have seen a real spike in these big cyber attacks going against big and small companies, government agencies, uh, the, the Colonial Pipeline attack, the meat packing company, SolarWinds, Microsoft Exchange. The, the hacks really show us again and again how vulnerable society is to these kind of cyber threats. Uh, everyday users have to be focused on the, the practical things they can do, like using multi-factor authentication. Uh, every day, Google is blocking more than 100 million phishing attack, attacks that never reach you. But if we do it right, we can make it easy for users. If we can build things in by default at scale and improve our infrastructure, that reduces the, uh, the effort that everyday people have to make to keep themselves safe. When I look at government and I look at the operation in different areas, you often get worried, like, do we have the best and the brightest uh, in these very complicated positions? I think about that a lot in terms of technology. I would assume that government leans a lot on companies like Google for advice, for talent. Talk about what Google does vis-a-vis -vis government in terms of helping government think about the cyber threat writ large. You mentioned a moment ago the meeting that the White House convened on cybersecurity, and that was an important step. They were right to call on agencies and companies to make cybersecurity a shared responsibility. Uh, we're trying to do our part there. We're working uh, with the White House and with others. to. Yeah, we've announced that we're investing over $10 billion in the next five years to strengthen cyber. Uh, that means expanding zero trust programs so that everyone is verified helping secure the software supply chain and enhancing open source security. So just last week, we made a contribution to the Linux Foundation to support a new open source security program. Uh, but again, fundamentally, it comes back to this notion of when it comes to cyber, it's better to prevent than respond. So working with governments, we need to figure out how do we change mindsets so people aren't just trying to bolt on security to legacy systems as an afterthought, but making them secure by design so that you know, encryption and multi-factor authentication are designed into the IT architecture of big organizations, but done in a way that's simple and scalable so people will really use them. You're Google, right? So you have access to a lot of talent. Uh, you have a, a massive army of technologists that work for you. A lot of people uh, watching this might work at much smaller companies and might not have the same resources or the same experience in combating a lot of these different uh, threats. What is your advice for somebody who's thinking about this, wants to be uh, more actively involved in helping prevent uh, hacks at their own company or their own organization? Like, What have you learned that would be helpful to them? No, I, I think security is a set of tools, but it's also a mindset really understanding your whole supply chain. You're only as strong as your weakest link and making sure that the vendors you're using are using the latest approaches to security, which may require some lift on your part to make sure that your infrastructure as secure is as secure as you think it is. Uh, that's a major endeavor. Now, we've made a lot of advances when it comes to cybersecurity in the last few years. And the, the latest tools coming off cloud-based security is better and better. At, at dealing with these kinds of things. Uh, but we're still seeing attackers at an ever-growing rate. Last week, we sent out over 14,000 emails to users who were targeted by government-based attackers. That includes journalists like you, government workers, people who work at NGOs, people who work at, at big companies and small companies. So we really need to work together. The companies have to be aware, the people have to be aware, the vendors have to be aware, and government has to help lead the charge on this. Kent, as we wrap up, I'm curious about the scale of this, like just taking Google, for instance, like how often are you having to mobilize to run after one of these threats, whether it's small or big? Is it every hour, every day, every week? Like what is the scale of that that you guys actually have to like, no, no, we're on guard. We got to do something. Yeah. So I mean, we've got dedicated teams who, who work on this and some of the most talented security researchers and, and experts in the world. Uh, but so for us, it's, you know, we, we have long been one of the most attacked websites in the world, uh, but we've gotten really good at dealing with these very sophisticated attacks. And one of the things we want to do is be able to share some of those learnings, some in open source ways, throw, some through our tools, and some through training more generally. Because to have a good national cybersecurity plan, you have to have the right people to implement it. 
Uh, there are something like half a million open cybersecurity jobs out there. Uh, we're trying to do our part by training 100,000 Americans in data privacy, data security, uh, and that will benefit, I think, ultimately everybody. But beyond that, we're also trying to train 10 million Americans in just digital skills and cyber awareness. So you have this mix of uh, specific expertise and general sensibility and philosophy about taking cyber seriously. This is one that's going to take a, a whole of society approach uh, to get cybersecurity right. And, and we're committed to doing our part in that. Uh, Kent Walker, uh, thank you uh, for a fascinating and important uh, discussion. Thank you to Google for making this broader uh, program uh, possible. And over to you, Margaret. Thanks, Jim. I'm Margaret Harding McGill, tech policy reporter at Axios. Our final guest is the chairman and co founder of Silverado Policy Accelerator, Dimitri Alperovich, joining us from Washington, D.C. Hi, Dimitri. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I want to do a table set of the conversation by first asking you to please discuss the impact that ransomware attacks have had on global supply chains. Well, ransomware has been a problem for a while now, but it certainly seems like the attacks have only accelerated, particularly in the last year or so. We have seen attacks on hospitals in the midst of the pandemic and a very disturbing story that some of your viewers have seen in the last week or so where um, the hospital in Alabama actually has been sued by a mother whose newborn died uh, in the midst of a ransomware attack on a hospital. Um, and, and in part, um, the plaintiff is claiming that the cameras, um, the monitors, the heartbeat monitors in the nursing stations that were shut down were responsible uh, for the death of this um, newborn, a very tragic case. So you're seeing enormous pressure on the healthcare system. Of course, we have seen attacks like Colonial on our energy supplies. We've seen numerous attacks on the food infrastructure with the GBS, uh, JBS meat processor, uh, a number of grain uh, producers um, in the last few weeks. Um, so really no organization, whether it's a government institution, police departments like the police department here in the um, uh, District of Columbia have been hit, fire departments, municipal governments, state governments, um, and of course, commercial industry um, across the, the spectrum that has been targeted by these ransomware attacks. So if these criminals believe that you can pay, um, they have the ability to pay a ransom, um, often uh, in the millions of, in the range of the millions of dollars, they're going to target you. And these these stories, especially the, the hospital attack um, with such a tragic loss of life, really hit home and show you what kind of real world impacts these attacks can have. And when we're looking at the different sizes of these businesses, I think maybe it's helpful to start on the private sector side. You're getting a huge range of, of companies. What, what steps can they realistically take in order to protect against um, future attacks from happening? It's really important to understand how these attacks work. So you have these criminal organizations, they're developing the ransomware platforms, they're developing the malware, but they're really not the ones launching the attacks. It's now a franchise model where they recruit affiliates, uh, people that uh, will buy access inside of a company that may hack that company, and then they will use the, the ransomware platform to distribute the malware and then uh, ultimately negotiate a ransom with a victim company. So it's really important to focus on the intrusion piece of the, of the equation, making sure that you're constantly hunting uh, your network for any signs of compromise, that you're responding quickly because these ransomware attacks do not go from zero to 60 in, in a second. Um, it takes time for them to get in, to establish themselves before the ransomware actually gets deployed. And oftentimes um, th that's measured in hours and, and even days. So defenders do have uh, uh, um, a capability to detect these things and, and, and eject them before um, the ransomware actually gets deployed and before it may be too late. And then of course, um, if you can't prevent that, focus on backups, focus on making sure that you have offline backups that cannot be destroyed by the ransomware group and that you can recover quickly. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why I see organizations pay ransom is not necessarily because they don't have backups or the backups are destroyed, but because they simply don't know how long it would take them to recover from those backups. And oftentimes CEOs of these companies make a decision in the first hours of the attack that they will rather pay the ransom than wait for hours and maybe even days to learn from their IT teams how long it would actually take to get the company back up and running. And so do you think CEOs are taking cybersecurity and these attacks more seriously now? And what do you see them doing in, in response? Are they 
establishing these backups uh, more? Like, what what steps do you see CEOs taking? Well, there's no question that, in part, the media headlines that everyone's reading these days about these ransomware attacks and, and broader cybercrime and nation state intrusion activity that we've been seeing over the number of years has driven much greater awareness um, in the boardrooms, uh, in the executive teams that cyber is important. Um, so the awareness is there. I, I'd say that there's still a huge gap in understanding of what to do. And in particular, um, one of the things that most um, CEOs don't appreciate is that this is not just a question of money. In fact, money may be the less relevant thing for um, establishing a great cybersecurity program. The most important thing is to actually empower your security, your security teams to be at the table when decisions are made about the business, about the types of technology choices you're going to make, about the types of um, uh, risk you're going to take on as a business, and making sure that their views are accounted for. And um, today, too few organizations have the, the, the chief information security officers or the CISOs have that level of power within the organization. It sounds like every company now needs to have some kind of security team. And is there even the labor pool to, su to supply those, those workers? It is a huge issue. Uh, the workforce development um, is, is a key problem that our industry faces. So you, you have the huge companies, the Googles of the world, the Amazons, that obviously don't have any problems recruiting talent um, and rewarding them with uh, massive compensation packages. Uh, but the rest of the industry really cannot compete with that. And thus, you know, the best and brighters are te uh, tend to go to these large platform companies. And uh, as a result, you have a huge shortage in both government and the rest of the private sector in being able to recruit uh, uh, talented people. And what can be what can be done about that problem? I mean, it seems like something that will take a long term solution, not a short term one. Yeah, there's no silver bullet, but we have to invest in education. Um, that's key. We need to pump, pump out more cybersecurity professionals out of our academic institutions. Uh, one of the things that I'm actually launching today is the Alperovitch Institute of Cybersecurity Studies um, at Johns Hopkins University's um, uh, SICE uh, Institute. And um, that goal of that program is to develop the next generation of cybersecurity professionals, particularly those with a policy background by offering a master's program, a PhD program, and an executive education program for executives in the private sector and the government. Okay, so that's happening on the private sector side, where you're working on the education front. What do we? What needs to happen on on the the federal side? Um, what, what can the government do? And specifically, I know that the uh, Biden administration has announced this uh, thirty country summit. Um, what do you hope comes out of that meeting? So the summit that's taking place this week is this ransomware summit. is is a really important event. At the end of the day, the only way we're going to tackle the ransomware problem is by engaging with our allies to take a number of steps. The first step is to regulate cryptocurrency transactions. Cryptocurrency is what fuels this ransomware ecosystem. It's no accident that there were virtually no ransomware attacks prior to the invention of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency schemes because there was no way to transfer funds, ransom funds anonymously to, um, to these criminals without them being traced. So it, it wasn't such a lucrative scheme to provide a bank account number where the, the, the wire could be sent only to have that money traced to the ultimate criminal and for them to be prosecuted or the money even um, stopped uh, through, through the use of the banking sector. So cryptocurrency solved that uh, problem for the criminals. And the governments can address that by making sure that all cryptocurrency exchanges worldwide are implementing KYC, know your customer standards, where anytime a large transaction is made that transfers cryptocurrency into fiat currency, into dollars, into euros, and what have you, that the exchange would demand identifying information, passport, uh, driver's license, et cetera, and that would provide that to law enforcement if requested. Um, they need to focus on AML, anti-money laundering schemes, the types of things that we have in the traditional banking systems um, now needs to be implemented in the cryptocurrency ecosystem through the use of these exchanges. And what these 30 countries can do is make, in, make sure that one, the cryptocurrency exchanges that operate within their borders are doing that, but also making sure that any cryptocurrency exchange globally that is not abiding by these KYC and ML standards is going to be blocked from the global financial system that um, their financial institutions will no longer operate 
with these rogue cryptocurrency exchanges. That would have a huge impact on, on this um, illicit um, uh, ecosystem, both ransomware and broader cybercrime. Um, the second thing that um, they need to do is really ramp up their law enforcement and intelligence community operations to infiltrate these groups, to understand what they're doing, to collect intelligence on them, and ultimately lead that to disruption. I recently wrote a New York Times op-ed where I talked about the need to really target three things when it comes to these ransomware gangs. Um, it's to target their infrastructure, um, their, the, the um, computing power that they use to launch these types of attacks and to recruit affiliates and to provide a platform for ransom negotiations, two, to target their people, to publicize uh, perhaps sometimes covertly who these individuals are, out them, sort of dox them out in the world so that there's a real cost to them in their daily life and their ability to travel. And third, uh, most importantly, to target their money. Um, as we've seen with the colonial uh, response, um, the um, U US government was able to retrieve part of that ransom in that operation. We need to see a lot more of those activities where we're targeting their uh, uh, Bitcoin wallets, we're targeting, targeting their uh, cryptocurrency infrastructure to make sure that they can't receive these illicit funds. Okay, and we're almost out of time. And that goes into your suggestion that there be a offensive strategy um, uh, beyond just the defensive one. Uh, specifically on Russia, I want to ask, why would uh, Vladimir Putin have any incentive to crack down on cyber crimes originating from his country? Well, today he absolutely does not have that incentive because we have not made it a key priority in the relationship. We have not made him care enough about this problem. Uh, there's no question that he has a capability to get these groups to, um, if not stop their attacks entirely, uh, um, at least to massively reduce the number of attacks we see against uh, the US and uh, other Western targets. Um, but today he has not experienced really any cost uh, that would uh, motivate him to take this action. And uh, I've argued uh, over the course of the last summer that we need to threaten uh, serious sanctions against the Russian economy, against their oil and gas sector, if he does not crack down. All right. And I guess it will, remains to be seen what will happen on that front. But Dimitri, thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. And thank you to our sponsor, Google, for making this event possible. For more info or to sign up for the Axios login newsletter, visit axios.com slash newsletters or on the Axios app. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you at axios.com. <laughs>